Fourier series, a profoundly important mathematical tool that transformed the way we perceive and operate the world. But did you know that there were seven discoveries that followed one another without which Fourier series would never happen? I know it as waves, but that's about it. So tell me how it started. During the 1700s, trigonometric series arose from the need to study practical problems in physics and in astronomy, like the orbits of planets and the motion of waves. But an interesting one was the vibration of musical strings. There was a desire to make better sounding instruments and better understand the nature of sound. And that required the study of oscillations. Imagine a string stretched tightly between two fixed points, like a guitar string, or in our case, like this uke string. You pluck the string, which initially calls a single large wave. After the pluck, the string doesn't just settle back into a flat line. It starts vibrating, forming a pattern of smaller waves. The study of this is known as the vibrating string problem. And the wave equation, here represented in its simplest form, is used to solve it. Here y is the displacement of the string at a point x and time t, and v is the speed of the wave through the string. When you pluck a guitar string, you displace part of it from its resting position. The initial shape of the string at the moment it is released forms the initial condition for the wave equation. The ends of the guitar string are fixed, which means the displacement y at these points must always be zero. These are called boundary conditions. Using methods from calculus, the wave equation can be solved considering the conditions we talked about. These vibrations can be broken down into simpler regular waves called sinusoidal waves, essentially smooth waves that mathematicians describe using sines and cosines. Mathematicians like Jean Lejond d'Alembert and Daniel Bernoulli propose representing y as a sum of sine and cosine terms or trigonometric series. The solution of the wave equation reveals that the string vibrates not only in the fundamental frequency, the lowest, simplest mode of vibration, but also in higher harmonics, overtones, where the string exhibits more complex patterns of vibration. As a result, each mode represents a specific musical note. Interesting how it all started with wanting to study such simple things, but how did it evolve into something more advanced? Like, how did it evolve further? Harmonious components showed that trigonometric series had the potential to analyze more complex problems. And it started this way, just as an application. Then it became a mathematical area on its own. But of course, we have to mention its origins. Joseph Fourier was interested in the problem of heat distribution and flow, specifically how temperature changes over time within various materials. A challenge he encountered while working on estimating the Earth's temperature deep below the surface. He was inspired by the success of trigonometric series in explaining oscillations and vibrations, and proposed that similar techniques could be applied to other physical phenomena, for example, heat. In this seminal work, The Analytical Theory of Heat, Fourier formally introduced what we now call Fourier series. If you guys are enjoying this video, please like and subscribe. Fourier took the idea of sinusoidal waves further, and he applied it to something totally different. The way heat spreads along a metal rod. Say one of the end of the rod is heated, and you want to know how the heat travels along the rod over time. Picture the temperature along the rod not just as a single number, but as a changing pattern along its length. Initially, the heated end is very hot and the far end is cool. Fourier suggested that this temperature pattern could be thought of as a series of simpler waves. By adding up these curves, trigonometric functions, you get the very accurate picture of how the temperature actually changes from one end of the rod to the other. And I assume the more terms we work with, the more accurate the representation is, right? Exactly. As more terms are added, the sum includes more frequency components, allowing it to better approximate the original function or shape. A common example used to illustrate this concept is the approximation of a square wave using a Fourier series. A square wave is a function that alternates between two values with instantaneous transitions, jumps, between these values. The Fourier series of a square wave is given by the following. Here n takes only odd values, 1, 3, 5, and so on, reflecting the fact that the square wave is an odd function. With just the first term, the approximation is very crude and resembles a single sinusoidal wave. 
Adding the next two terms, the approximation starts to look more like a square wave, with flatter tops and bottoms. As more terms are added, the approximation increasingly captures the sharp transitions of the square. The top and bottom segments become flatter, and the transitions between negative 1 and 1 become steeper and closer to the ideal vertical jumps of a true square wave. It's very interesting to finally understand that, but I assume it didn't get accepted right away, right? No. It was pretty controversial. Fourier series are limited to periodic functions, or functions defined on a finite interval. So we developed the Fourier transform. Unlike the Fourier series, which decomposes a function into a sum of sinusoidal functions, the Fourier transform decomposes a function into a continuous spectrum of frequencies. It is defined as the following, where f of t is the function being transformed, and f of omega is the result of the transform showing how much of each frequency omega is present in the original function. Fourier provided evidence and some mathematical proof for his claims, but he did not prove that these series would always converge to the original function, under all conditions, in a way that was rigorous. Enter Johann Peter Gustav Lewin Dirichlet, a German mathematician who took up the challenge in the early 19th century. Dirichlet established conditions that are now known as Dirichlet's conditions, which help ensure the convergence of these Fourier series. These are the conditions. Periodicity. The function must be periodic. That is, it repeats its values in regular intervals, just like the trigonometric functions used in the series. Finite number of discontinuities. The function should always have a finite number of discontinuities, jumps, breaks, etc., in any one period. Too many discontinuities can make the function too erratic for a Fourier series to converge properly. Finite number of extrema. The function must have a finite number of maxima and minima within any one period. This condition ensures that the function does not oscillate too widely, which can also prevent convergence. Bounded variation. The function must not oscillate infinitely rapidly and must have bounded variation within a period. The establishment of these conditions allowed for more reliable and predictable use of Fourier series across various fields. All right, but I assume they had to understand the limits and behaviors of these series under different conditions. Right. Hence, convergence and summation techniques come in. There are many of them, and we don't have time to go into all of them. But I also don't want to be superficial. So let's focus just on one so that we can give you an idea. Cesaro summation. It's about the surrounding points of a discontinuity or where the series converges slowly. Instead of looking at the sum directly, it considers the average of all partial sums up to a given point. If Sn of f denotes the nth partial sum of the Fourier series of a function f, the Cesaro sum is given by the following. Directly summing the Fourier series of a square wave, especially near the discontinuities, results in overshoots. With the Cesaro summation, we average partial sums, and thus the overshoots are dampened, and the series converges more smoothly to the function, even near points of discontinuity. In sound, for example, it ensures that the transformed signals are smoother and more representative of the true underlying phenomena, increasing the accuracy of analysis and the quality of reconstructed signals. I see, but I assume discontinuities must have been a problem, right? Yes. George Cantor was a German mathematician who revolutionized mathematics by creating set theory, which helped in this regard. Set theory is a branch of mathematical logic that studies sets, which are collections of objects. These objects can be anything, numbers, symbols, points, etc. George Cantor is credited with its development, and he provided the first description that was rigorous of what sets are and how they are manipulated. Imagine a light switch that you flip up and down to turn a light on or off. Say up, 1, represents the light on. Down, 0, represents the light being off. The pattern repeats on, off, on, off, and so on. In terms of Fourier series, we want to represent this on-off pattern using waves or sines and cosines. The tricky part is that the square wave jumps suddenly from 0 to 1 and back. These jumps are called discontinuities. Using set theory, we can consider all these jumping points together as a group, or a set. 
Set theory allows us to ask, how big is this group of special points in terms of the entire pattern? Surprisingly, even though there are many jumps compared to the entire repeating pattern, the group of jumps takes up almost no space at all, and we say that it has measure zero. Finally getting to the end of it, so what's the last advancement? A Hilbert space, named after David Hilbert, can be thought of as an infinite dimensional version of Euclidean space where concepts like orthogonality or perpendicularity, norm or distance and projection make sense and are mathematically rigorous. Hilbert spaces provide a natural setting for studying Fourier series, because they allow functions to be treated as vectors. This perspective is crucial because it allows for the application of linear algebra techniques to problems in function analysis. In a Hilbert space, the concepts of orthogonality and completeness are pivotal. The function sine of nx and cosine of nx, which are used in Fourier series, are orthogonal to each other with respect to the inner product defined by the integral of their product over an interval. This orthogonality is a key property that ensures the convergence of the Fourier series in the space of square integrable functions typically denoted as L2. The completeness of a Hilbert space, especially the L2 space, guarantees that every Cauchy sequence of functions has a limit within the space. That was very interesting. It's nice to see the complete picture of the field. And here's something fun that you can watch right now as a little bit of a break. Check out this video right here. See you guys there.